in Conversation. Our series of interviews with leading uh, pioneers in chemistry. And today, I'm delighted to have as our guest, honored to have as our guest, uh, Professor Gautam Desiraju. Uh, he's Professor of Solid State and Structural Chemistry at the Indian Institute of Science in Bangalore, India. Welcome, Gautam. Thank you so much, Eric. It's indeed a pleasure for me uh, to be interviewed by JSCS. Thank you. It's great to have you on the editorial advisory board uh, of the journal, where we can count on your experience um, and wisdom in guiding the future of uh, JAXA. Let me begin with a short introduction of your background, and then I'd like to explore um, some of those um, aspects that are going to come up in the in the introduction because you have a fascinating background um, as to how you got to where you are today a leader in uh, crystal engineering and supramolecular chemistry so you were born in madras i believe uh, currently uh, known by chennai a beautiful place i was at not long ago you obtained your bachelor's in science at saint xavier college um, in bombay that's right. PhD was in 1976, and you were with the uh, incredibly well-known and leader in the field, uh, Dr. Uh, David Curtin, whom I also had the pleasure of having my first class in organic chemistry while as an undergraduate at the University of Illinois. And he inspired me oh, yes. uh, to go into organic oh, yes. chemistry, so I, you're lucky to have had him as an advisor. You've reminded me of Dr. Curtin suddenly. I was one of his last PhD students. And uh, he had just, I think, maybe seven to eight years before I joined him in 72, he was, he had switched over into this organic solid state chemistry. So a remarkable personality and uh, someone from whom I've learned a lot. He was a very quiet man. And I think sometimes the best teachers are the quietest. And is he the one that inspired you to work on solid state chemistry and, and crystal engineering? You know, Eric, it wasn't much of a subject in those days. And uh, there were very few people who even believed that there could be any chemistry within an organic solid. Uh, most of it, you know, most of the people felt that, well, whatever needed to be done or learned was done in solution. So I think the very idea looked unusual and to some almost outlandish. Working in a field about which no, people don't know too much, I think is, is a wonderful experience because it, it's like, you know, it allows you to explore and you don't know what you're going to find and where you're going to find it. I think that is the charm of research in the end. And I took up my permanent position in Hyderabad in 79. University of Hyderabad was a new university full of uh, young faculty like me. I think I, one of the biggest advantages I've had in India was that uh, in a country which is traditionally so patriarchal and, you know, heavy top-down kind of a system where everything is controlled by the big bosses and their big bosses. Here was a brand new university which started out of nowhere and uh, the people in charge of the university took an inspired decision at least in the chemistry department that they would appoint mostly or almost all only lecturers that is at the assistant professor level. And so we sort of went along and made our own rules in this talented department. The organic chemists felt that I was doing physical chemistry and the physical chemists felt I was doing organic chemistry. And nobody knew a whole lot about crystallography, which was my second expertise because in Illinois, I was again fortunate that I was a student in the Curtin Paul research group. Uh, two people signed my PhD thesis, which is very unusual then and now. 
David Curtin was the chemist and Ian Paul, a student of the legendary J.M. Robertson, was the crystallographer. So crystallography was unknown. So this business of organic and physical, uh, that's what really confused me. I didn't know really what I was doing and felt uneasy that I could not be neatly docketed into one of these categories. And this went down to as basic a level as what course can he teach or what course should he teach. You see, and by 81, I was, the confusion was complete. And <laughs> uh, in 82, uh, I had the opportunity to, of spending a summer, three months in Cambridge in the group of uh, J.M. Thomas. Yeah. Again, another remarkable person who has influenced me in my research. And uh, I spent three months with him in his group in Cambridge. And uh, by pure luck, I had an appointment. Somebody got me an appointment, someone from India who knew him, with the venerable Alexander Todd. So here was I, a lecturer, you know, who felt quite ignorant at that time and then meeting the great Lord Todd in his college. And uh, in my usual way, I, you know, I was quite, uh, I expressed to him immediately, I said, look, I told him this organic physical issue that I've just told you. Then, you know, he, he, he threw his head back and started laughing. Then he said, young man, let me tell you something. The same thing happened to me. <laughs> he said, when I started my career, people, you know, felt, the biologist felt I was a chemist and the chemist felt I was a biologist and things like that. And so he said, I did not fit into any of their standard and in fact, I believe the great Ruzitska told him, he shared that with me. He said, don't work on nucleic acids because that's not organic chemistry. <laughs> I think he you said think? the same thing to a common friend of ours, uh, Jack Dunnett. Ah, okay. Okay. So see, the, 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 it's, it's consistent. So then he said, look, he said, I want to tell you something. So he said that uh, it's a very nice thing that People can't bracket you neatly into this docket or that docket. Because he says, if you are exploring stuff in the gap areas, he says they become tomorrow's mainstream areas. What, what do you see as the vision for your field um, in the coming years? Uh, important new directions that it needs to take. The future is extremely bright because uh, you can see that Crystal engineering developed as a sub-branch of supramolecular chemistry after work done by me and several others in, let us say, roughly the late 80s or mostly up to the mid 90s, still my Synthon paper. After that, it was a veritable explosion and uh, crystal engineering after 2005 has itself developed many offshoots. And these things have become, you know, big areas in themselves today. For example, the, I think the most dramatic, well, two dramatic examples is polymorphism and co-crystals, which goes into the pharmaceutical industry type of application. The other one, big one is the idea of mechanical properties of crystals and also linked up to the idea of mechanochemistry a solid state reaction. So we started in solid state reaction and then we come back again to the same place. And the idea that, you know, you can take a crystal and then bend it and twist it and... Who were some of your mentors and your heroes when, when you were starting out that uh, made a difference? My heroes, yeah, Eric, you asked that question. My heroes were dead long before I was even born. My heroes are Will Stater, Ostwald, Bayer, Liebig, Kekule, Werner, 
they are the people who laid the foundation of our magnificent subject. And I think if you look at what we are doing, Pauling came afterwards, so he put this on a, some of these things on a quantitative basis. But Pauling himself says that what he is saying only reinforces some of the things that Werner said, etc., etc. And my heroes are really, I think they are all timers. People who are closer to my cognition, you know, I am more wary about, because there's some, some of them are even practicing scientists. So they, I would call them mentors, inspirational figures, but I won't use the word hero. You know, Ostwald, he created the whole subject of physical chemistry. It was a kind of a vague mishmash, Emil Fischer. I mean, he separated biochemistry from chemistry. So I think these are the people who put chemistry into, you know, vanguard positions for the next 30, 50, 70 years. So, and chemistry is a subject like that. It is incredibly capable of changing itself. And uh, those who resist this are the ones who are very good researchers, but don't get into becoming excellent researchers, in my view. So, so I'm curious, what advice would you give a young person, um, in particular, what to avoid as he or she is starting out their career and um, trying to make a name for themselves and uh, trying to make uh, their own contribution to the science? Two, three things, quite important in my view. You will obviously be inspired by your mentors, immediate mentors. I was lucky that I didn't have a postdoctoral mentor. I simply sort of floated from my PhD to a state of joblessness to getting my first job in Hyderabad. So I view if I had had more mentors, it would have meant for me more interference into my own thinking. So if you have one mentor as a PhD supervisor, I had two and if they're very good then sometimes you may be better off if you straight away get into academics, if you are cut out for that kind of situation. So, at the same time, never do projects of the type that were done in your mentor's lab. It's not that no, the that's mentor good is... Yeah, it's not that the mentor is, is cleverer than you. Maybe you are cleverer than him also. But the thing is, he, just, he or she has just that much more experience in that particular area of work. And so whatever you do, to some extent, your thinking will be colored by the thinking of the mentor. And plus, there is this obvious popular thing. Oh, you know, this guy or... This lady is so-and-so student, so, you know, we expect things like this and it cuts the other way also. If you come up to some standard, they'll say, oh, this is what we expected. And if you don't come up to that standard, they'll say, ho oh, oh, I mean, he's so-and-so's uh, student and still he's not able to come up. So you lose both ways if you associate yourself psychologically too much with your mentor. That's the first point. Second point, I'll, I've already mentioned, look for gap areas. Because definitely, in, in chemistry at least, it is the gap areas. I don't know enough about other subjects, but in chemistry, I'll say for sure, there has been some work done in certain areas which led to certain blanks, some questions, some omissions, something that people couldn't explain and then they slid under the rug. So you have to go and pull these things out. and. Uh, Try and snoop around a little bit, for which you need some kind of quality time. And that brings me to the third point. In the beginning of your career, speak less and listen more. Your own thoughts, your own ideas are still half-baked. I know this sounds very strange to say. In our modern scientific culture where 
everybody young middle aged old they run around in a hectic fashion and want to prove the whole to the whole world that the research they have done the last year is the best research they have ever done in their life no this is mathematically impossible because if you did if you were like that then all of us would be in a state of exponential advancement which very fortunately we all are not you actually spent some time in industry i believe at uh, eastman uh, between oh, yes. your PH, between your phd and starting at hyderabad oh. i seem to recall so what was that experience like and i guess you realized you didn't want to oh, work yes. in industry after that, right <laughs> No, no, I, I wouldn't have minded working in industry. I didn't want to stay in the U.S. Uh huh. I, Eastman was a lovely place, and uh, the joke was that uh, in those days, that every third chemist from Illinois goes to Dupont, and every second chemist from Illinois goes to Eastman. <laughs> and uh, of course, Illinois and Eastman Kodak had a long history, as you know, with Roger Adams. and how eastman sure. tennessee was first founded it's a summer project of undergrad students which started actually the whole fine chemical industry in the us so those the mid 70s were extremely bad years for uh, chemistry phd's to get employment and once again like a few years later i was confused because i didn't know what i wanted to do and mostly i didn't know in which country i wanted to live because my experience in illinois in the us was so nice it is the probably most magnificent you know period one of in my life because i learned everything and i learned everything not just in chemistry but especially i feel because it was in the midwest i think the, the idea which came to me from the midwest is you have to give value for money taken and i think it's a very peculiar concept uh, which really appealed to me and so i was and still am in great admiration of the us no doubt about that and kodak was a wonderful place when i was there there were a thousand phd chemists in the r&d sector as well as dupont interestingly 10 years later i spent a one year sabbatical in dupont in experimental station where still a lot of high quality chemistry was going on i asked my friend rich anderson i said which suppose eastman was located in san diego do you think i would have stayed on in the us so he 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 looks at me and he says na he said this is another very important thing it is the cultural aspect and i think that uh, people don't quite appreciate the enormous differences in culture between different parts of the world the beautiful thing about science jacks and things like that is that the kind of science that is done and published and is exactly the same and yet this means that we can get to it in so many different routes since you're on the editorial advisory board of uh, the journal of the american chemical society i'm curious if i could ask you um Do you have advice for Jax how to steer itself into the rough waters of the future? Um, what what recommendations? What advice would you give uh, the journal? As someone who comes from a five thousand year old country, <laughs> time matters. Length length of time matters. One hundred and forty three is a huge thing in this age of Twitter, where the time scale is forty eight hours. you know so don't 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 throw away that 143 year advantage because it is based not on just a blind adherence to the past that past also has been changing it's been evolving like chemistry Chem jax is just a reflection of the highest levels of world chemistry so as chemistry has evolved jax will automatically evolve So just see to it that you have a blend of established people, new people, young people, everybody coming in. As an editor in chief, I would say you must strike a balance between continuity and change. 
that balance is very delicate and if you right. try to if you go if you err too much on either side it will have bad consequences for the journal but don't worry about what other journals are doing well thank you thank you for that insightful uh commentary much appreciated and um, I hope we can follow those uh, words of wisdom as we move into the future. This uh, sort of brings us to a close of this interview. I know it's late in the evening for you. I want to thank you uh, for taking time uh, to share with us some of your uh, visions of science and uh, advice on um, how to move science and publications and science forward. Um, it's been great uh, sharing this time with you. So thank you. Well, thank you, thank you, thank you so much. Eric, and thank you, all the others in the Jack's office. My many thanks to the journal for sustaining me for so many years in so many capacities. It's a wonderful asset to have you uh, on the editorial advisory board. Um, and so it's great to have you in there. <laughs> thank you, Gautam. Thank you. Thank you very much. Good morning, because that's what it is where you are. And uh, all the very best, Eric, in your efforts. <laughs>